in Southeast Asia with my 1913 Bradshaw's Handbook. Published at the height of European imperialism, my 100-year-old guidebook will lead me on a railway adventure through archipelagos and peninsulas, dotted with hills, forests, and paddy fields. I'll tour towering megacities and magnificent mosques. I'll encounter golden Buddhas and jeweled temples and experience some of the world's most spectacular and notorious railways. As I travel through the diverse nations of this vast region, I'll learn how they asserted their independence against the British, French, and Dutch empires to become the economic tigers and dragons of today. railway adventure through Southeast Asia resumes in the southern archipelago of Indonesia. I'm crossing the island of Java, home to 130 million Indonesians, more than half the population. I began in the capital Jakarta, then visited the royal city of Yogyakarta and its sister city Surakarta. I'll now explore Ambarawa before calling at the port of Semarang, then head to East Java to finish in Surabaya, the city of heroes. En route, I find that I can't handle my drink. The beans are very hot. Ah! Mmm, <laughs> smells good. I balance culture and tradition. I don't know how they do it. They don't stay still for a minute. And I'll hear of a momentous event in Indonesian history. They climbed the tower and they tore off the blue part of the, of the flag and then rehoisted the red and white flag. I'm in central Java. I've come to the hills above Ambarawa. It's a little bit cooler here, there's a breeze, lush vegetation. This resort sits at the heart of a coffee plantation. Of course, this reception building has a familiar look. It's the old Mayong railway station, dated 1873. It stood in the way of a new highway and was to be demolished. But Gabriela, then the owner of this property, saved it, brought it here on 40 lorries one stormy night and reassembled it. Greater love hath no woman than that she should rescue a railway station. Please enjoy the welcome drink. Thank you very much indeed. This is ginger and palm sugar. Ooh. It's warm and sugary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please have a seat. Time to smell the coffee. Hello, good morning, Michael. Lovely to see you, Yo-Yo. Lovely to see you. Let's what a beautiful walk. morning. Yes, let's walk to the coffee plantation. Thank you. Yo-Yo works as a tour guide here. So this is the coffee plant. During three months, we harvest all the coffee beans because we harvest only the ripe one. So it takes around three months to harvest all the beans. W which months are the harvest months? Uh, now it's the uh, mid of the year, from July, August, September. Mm -hmm. A good crop this year? Yes, a very good crop. Tell me please a little bit about the history of coffee plantations here. So the, uh, the history of the coffee in Indonesia, firstly brought by Dutch to Indonesia, 
first time the coffee plant in Indonesia was planted in uh, Jakarta. And tell me about the history of this particular plantation. So this uh, particular coffee plantation started in around 1920s and we have uh, 11 hectares for the coffee plant and 11 others for the resort. So total now we have uh, 22 hectares. How much coffee does the plantation produce? Uh, last year we can have uh, 12,000 kilograms, around uh, 12 tons. But after the uh, drying, peeling process, we get only the uh, three tons with the net weight. So we have 90% uh, robusta because the altitude here, 687 meters above the level, that's very ideal for robusta coin. Do you know, I'm very excited. This is the first time I've ever been in a coffee plantation. Yes. Could we see some being picked and processed? Yes, of course. Coffee was established for cultivation in Indonesia in the 17th century by Dutch colonists, using seedlings imported by Muslim traders from Malabar. The plants flourished in Java's rich volcanic soil. In 1711, the Dutch East India Company began to export Java coffee to Europe and to sell it at auction in Amsterdam which became the coffee capital of the world. So, Michael, I will show you this. Do you know what is this tree? No. Durian trees. Do you know durian? No. The stinky fruit. <laughs> stinky. But because the smell is very strong, but very delicious, very sweet. Mainly, the durian trees here we use for shade for the coffee trees. But for the other benefits, we have a durian and we eat it. Now that you mention it, I think I've seen some notices in public places yes. saying no eating of durian here, is that right? Yes, that's right. Because <laughs> they're smelly. Yes. <laughs> Coffee was very profitable for the Dutch, but not for Java's peasant farmers. The Dutch employed a system of forced cultivation, whereby farmers had to turn over a portion of land, which they had used to grow food, to coffee and other cash crops. This resulted in widespread famine. So, Michael, this is the man picking up the coffee beans. Good morning. Today, Indonesia is the world's fourth largest producer of coffee, and 96% of it is grown on small holdings. We only pick the red bean. Red means the bean was ripe. So you see here, in one group, they're not ripe in the same time. Yeah. Only a few coffee beans was ripe. So we pick the red. You want to pick? Yeah, sure. sure. So all of these I can pick? Yes, yeah. And we will come back to these trees around seven, ten days later. That's the reason why we need around three months to harvest all the coffee beans. And we have no machine to pick it up the, all the coffee beans. It all has to be done by, by hand. Manually by hand. No smell before we roast it. No, there's nothing yep. that tells me that's coffee at all. Nothing. <laughs> and is it, uh, is it okay to taste it? Yeah, sure. Is it sweet? Quite sweet. But again, no taste of coffee. Yeah. Colour of my shirt, don't pick. Colour of my trousers, pick. Beans are dried under the sun before they are hulled. What an amazing scene! My goodness! So the beans are in that drum? Yes, uh, we can put here the coffee bean, maximum 30 kilos, mm. two hours roasting. Wonderful smell. Now it smells of coffee. On here, yes? Yes. Now the process of the cooling down the coffee bean. Do you have to keep moving the coffee during yes. the cooling? Because if you didn't moving this, it will be burning the, the beans. Uh -huh. Because it's very hot, the beans. All the timings are very, very critical, yeah? Yes, you're right. The beans are very hot. Ah! Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> smells good. Also, you can eat it. I can eat it. 
Oh, that's the real thing. That's fantastic. Mmm, cracks in between my teeth. Then <laughs> a lovely smell of coffee and taste of coffee. Oh, it's brilliant. I need a cup. <laughs> This is, for me, a very evocative moment. When I was a little boy, I was going to stay with my grandparents in Scotland. They were very old-fashioned. And my job every evening was to grind the coffee with a hand mill like this for the morning. And the smell of it takes me straight back to my childhood. This is my Madeleine Proustian moment. How do you drink your coffee in Indonesia? It's very simple and very easy, Michael. It's just the coffee ground with the hot water. A, a bit like uh, Turkey? Yes, oh. like a Turkey coffee. So all the coffee grounds will, be at, the, will be at the bottom here, yeah, the sediment. The bottom, yes. Well, it looked good. Yes. It smelled good. And now let's see whether it tastes good. Hmm. If you feel drowsy in the morning, just java coffee. Java coffee. From Ambarawa, the line heads north to the coast, to a port that became important during colonial times. A railway line pretty much the length of Java, from Jakarta to Surabaya, was completed by 1894, and the headquarters of the Dutch East Indies Railway Company was at Samarang. Indonesia's first train pulled out of Semarang Station on the 10th of August, 1867. By the time of my 1913 Bradshaw's guidebook, Semarang had become a communist and nationalist stronghold and was known as the Red City. The overwhelming majority of its citizens is Muslim. And here in the capital of central Java is the Great Mosque. Islam spread irresistibly through the so-called East Indies, arriving at the coasts and penetrating inland. Today, almost nine in 10 Indonesians are Muslim. You hear the call to prayer echoing through the cities and women very widely wear the hijab. But this is not an Islamic state. Religious tolerance is written into the constitution which is particularly important for the large Christian minority. But the sheer scale of this 21st century mosque is a reminder that there are more Muslims in Indonesia than any other country. Four elegant pencil minarets pointing at the sky, an enormous dome tiled. And behind me, the principal minaret that must be visible for miles and miles around. Semarang is a small city by Indonesian standards, although the population is still well over a million. It's largely industrial. I feel like I might be standing on the only tourist attraction. Even from this great height, the mosque looks enormous. The capacity of the courtyard for worshippers easily exceeds that of the building. You must be able to get thousands of people there, protected by the largest sun umbrellas that I have ever seen. Under Dutch rule, Semarang grew into an important trading center, surpassing rival ports 
to become second only to the capital of the East Indies, Batavia. From the tower at the mosque, I could see none of this. Beneath the city's industrial veneer, I've discovered an enclave of Dutch colonial buildings, like peeling off the red rind of a good Edam cheese. I'm returning to Semarang Station to board the train to my last stop. I'm traveling on what Bradshaws calls a trunk line, extended to Surabaya. In the evening light, I've crossed into the province of East Java, in these parts in 1880, a 20-year-old tobacco farmer discovered oil on his land. Within 10 years, he'd sunk a successful production well and founded Royal Dutch. In the years before my guidebook, the company merged to become Royal Dutch Shell. And to this day, petroleum is an important export for Indonesia. in Surabaya. Bradshaws tells me it's on the narrow strait facing the island of Madura, 115 miles from Semarang or 30 hours by steamer. This is the second largest city in Java, but it's just a fraction of the size of Jakarta. And although it has sprouted some skyscrapers, you feel that influences from outside are much less strongly felt here. This is the city to look for tradition. Hello, Denny. Hey, hello, Michael. How lovely to see you. It looks awfully narrow in there. Shall I just follow you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go. I feel like I should be trailing a piece of string. I would never get myself out of here. I'd lose my way. Mercifully, Denny Sulfika has offered to guide me through the labyrinth. <laughs> Whoa. I don't know how they do it. They won't stay still for a minute. <laughs> Denny, there seem to be really amazing quantities of things like garlic and onions. Can they possibly sell all of this? Of course, Mike. Of yeah. course, yes. It's not only for the Surabaya people. Because like some people, they like to sell it again, resell it again to their region nearby, their homes. And, and tell me about this building. This is, of course, quite different from the first bit of the market that we came into? Oh, the building itself is like uh, built during the, the Netherlands occupation. So it's around 1841s. Some people, they love to go to the markets, like more modern one, like with the aircon and stuff like that. But here, they still preserve, and a lot of locals still prefer to come here because it's cheaper and stuff like that. Well, it's cheaper, colorful, uh, noisy, so traditional. It's got amazing atmosphere. Yeah. And tell me about the hat what you're wearing today. The hat itself, it's called uh, Udeng. Udeng? Udeng, yes. This one is uh, native to Surabaya. Indonesia has more than 130 tribes. Udeng is not native only to Surabaya, so they have their own custom. And are you very aware of your tribe? Does it, does it matter to you? Yes. For me, in my case, as I'm also an ambassador of the country, so I would like to uh, show it and what, uh, whenever possible. It's not only to show the places, not only to show the cultures, but also the identity of the people. So you enjoy wearing your Udeng? I really enjoy it. <laughs> The 
tribes, traditions, customs, and beliefs retain a striking vibrancy in Indonesia. Everywhere I turn, I see their expression. Yes, like a dikit. Small? Yeah. It's small? Small, my bin. But it's very nice, it's fantastic. In a back street, I've come across preparations for a performance. Hello, tell me about the dance. Ah, tarian kuda lumping menggambarkan sejarahnya kerajaan kediri yang gagah berani menghadapi lawan dari Ponorogo. It seems to involve a lot of young people. Young people seem keen on it. Banyak di sini anak muda seperti ini mulai dari usia 27 sampai 7 tahun sudah mengikuti belajar di kesenian kuda kepa untuk menguri kebudayaan yang adil. Dances like this have passed from one generation to the next in an oral tradition that can be centuries old. An extraordinarily intense dance. Horsemen have come out and faced the cracking whip. The dancers are warriors on horseback advancing into battle. In this case, apparently for a princess to marry their king. What is so amazing to me is this is not a pastiche recreation for tourists in a theatre. There isn't a single tourist here. We're in an alleyway in Surabaya. These are the neighbourhood. These are the community dancers and musicians, and they've come together to do this amazing spectacle. I think the knights beat the dragons, but I'm not sure. And now the dance seems to have become much more freestyle. In the old days when this dance was performed, people used to go into trances and do crazy things like eat glass and walk on coals. I can just about imagine that as the rhythms become more insistent. I think this has been the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. It started like a pageant and then it became sometimes entertaining and sometimes intense and sometimes even disturbing. I certainly feel like I've come a very long way from Jakarta. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Extraordinary. I'm heading back to my hotel, today called the Majapahit, built at the time of my Bradshaws. At the end of the Second World War, this was the scene of momentous events, which would earn Surabaya the moniker City of Heroes. In 1945, this was the spacious Hotel Orange, and during the Japanese occupation, this was their military headquarters in East Java. In September of that year, when the Second World War had ended, the Dutch flag again flew above the building, red, white and blue stripes. But some young Indonesian revolutionaries fighting for independence scaled the roof, tore away the blue stripe, leaving the red and white flag of Indonesia standing for the blood and bone that patriots were prepared to sacrifice. That was the prelude to terrible violence. But at the end of that, that red and white flag would fly everywhere across the archipelago of Indonesia. Adi is an historian who can tell me more about this symbolic moment in Indonesian history. All right, uh, we're on the roof now. And this is a very important part of the building because the flag incident in September 1945 happened here. 
The Dutch, uh, they hoisted the red, white, and blue flag at that flagpole over there. The Dutch flag? The Dutch flag, yes. And the Indonesians saw that, and they began to flock into the hotel. And some of these people, these uh, young lads, they, they climbed the tower and they tore off the blue part of the, of the flag and then re-hoisted the red and white flag. So the red and white flag is hoisted by these young people at the hotel. What's the reaction? After the flag was raised, uh, there were brawls inside the hotel between the Dutch uh, personnel and also Indonesians. And I think two or three Indonesians were uh, killed, and also a Dutchman was killed. Nationalists resisted Dutch troops, and a British contingent was sent to help them reimpose imperial control. A bloody showdown ensued, known as the Battle of Surabaya. Fighting lasted for three weeks, but even in the face of certain defeat, Indonesians refused to surrender. With what sort of casualties? And 20,000 people killed and tens of thousands of civilians also wounded and killed. As Indonesians look back on their war of independence, what importance do they give to Surabaya? We see the battle as the, uh, the battle that kick-started the revolution. And also during that time, Surabaya became some sort of rallying cry for the Republican causes. Would school children today be taught about this incident? Yes, yes, of course, yes. Actually, this incident is celebrated every September. They, have, they hold these uh, carnivals and uh, parades and that culminate in this, uh, in this hotel. The Battle of Surabaya was the prelude to a four-year war between the Netherlands and Indonesia, at the end of which those red and white stripes would be hoisted on every flagpole in Indonesia. It seems extraordinary to a modern audience that even after the Second World War, the Netherlands, a small European Christian country, could believe that it should govern 70-odd million mainly Muslim Indonesians. France, Britain and Holland were addicted to imperialism, believing that somehow they would not survive the loss of their colonies. Since independence, Indonesia has thrived culturally and its population has exploded. As a secular state with the largest Muslim population on the globe, it can play a good influential role in a world torn apart by sectarian divisions. Next time, in Malaysia, I enjoy a little flutter. Ah, oh, that's magical. Chance my arm at the Eton of the East. And experience an exhilarating ascent. Much faster than any funicular I've ever been on. This is like something out of the fun fair. Priceless art owned by Her Majesty hasn't been touched for almost 30 years. Until now, and they uncover quite a mystery. Secrets of Museum at 8. But next, they know everything about the countryside and nothing about antiques. We have another celebrity road trip 